Hi, you are listening to Baju Talk, a podcast for government services professionals. My name is Bhaskar Sundram, and I will be sitting down with our government services leaders to share their stories, discuss their career, and learn all about their values and collective impact in our society. Today's guest is Colin Double. Colin is founding director and CEO of Mighty Care and Custody. Colin is a management and finance professional with over 25 years of experience in outsourced criminal justice sector. He held senior positions in leading private private providers of custodial services including Group 4, GSL, Geo Group. He founded Mighty Care and Custody, a shared equity startup in 2009. Colin's strategic direction and strong understanding of Secure Environments held care in custody, winning over $1 billion worth of business within eight years of operations. Now, the startup became one of the largest providers of immigration detention centers to the UK Home Office. Welcome, Colin, to Baju Talk. Great to have you. Thank you, Baz. Good morning. Good morning, Colin. So let's go back to the very beginning, Colin. So where were you born? And let's talk about your high school and your education. I was I was born in Worksop, Nottinghamshire. So uh, people wouldn't probably don't know where that is, but it's it's just south of Sheffield. So I uh, I grew up in a predominantly mining community. Um, so in those days, it was very much driven by. Uh, I had two career options, really, at school. Uh, one was to uh, go and work down the pit, and the other was either to work in the power stations. Uh, so in that, the area I, I grew up, they, they were the major industries. It was, uh, it was digging coal out of the ground and, uh, and then turning it into electricity. Um, I have to say it wasn't for me. Uh, I think I worked out fairly early on that, I really didn't want to do anything like that. Uh, my father was a was a bit of an entrepreneur. He had a painting and decorating business that he'd uh, he built up with my brothers. Uh, so the two of my siblings worked with my father, and he'd also got a couple of uh, paint and wallpaper shops. Mm-hmm. So really, my my world was um, uh, as I was growing up. It was painting and decorating. That's what I spent my summers doing. Uh, and I say I grew up in a community that was very much driven in those days by, uh, I, I guess, what we consider now sort of heavy industry and stuff that just doesn't really exist anymore. And um, yeah, the, the school life for me was secondary modern school. Um, I, I couldn't do O levels. Uh, I had to do CSEs uh, because I didn't pass my eleven plus. So. Uh, career options were limited, I would say. I say there, there wasn't a lot of drive, a lot of ambition in that area at that time. Um, so I took myself off to uh, a college. I went off and did some O levels, and then I did some A levels, uh, and then that took me into my first job in Sheffield. Oh, wow! So entrepreneurial father, summer work, Sheffield. So, what were you doing in Sheffield, um, Colin? What was the first job? Uh, so, my first job, and I've got to say, I, I, I detested it. <laughs> my first job was uh, I was a finance trainee, so I got a job with a, a company called Burnett and Hallamshire. And Burnett and Hallamshire, in those days, was a, a, a bit of a conglomerate. Uh, they were predominantly into, again, here comes mining, but they were into own cast coal mining uh, and property development uh, predominantly. And I got, a, I got a job in Sheffield in their head office. Uh, I was working at the time with the group treasurer and with the group financial accountant. Uh, and I, yeah, I just found it incredibly dull. Mm. Uh, however, what, what they did do for me they started me on the road to a professional qualification so they encouraged me to uh, do my uh, what is now known as SEMA I forget what it was called in those days I think it was chartered works accountants or something like that but uh, set me on the road to to do that so I I went off on day release to start to study to uh, be a, be, become a chartered management accountant so that that was sort of my my uh, my early career and my my introdu- introduction into the world of work. 
Oh, wow, that's brilliant. At what point did you move to the justice sector? Uh, so I, I, I left Burnett and Hallamshire mm. and I went to work for um, a local civil engineering business called AF Budge. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Budge, again, uh, is the mining fee. Uh, had two two parts of its business. One was a, a civil engineering business, uh, and the other part again was open cast coal mining. Mm -hmm. uh, so it it was it was effectively owned and run by two brothers. So uh, uh, at, at that time, the business was turning over something like three hundred million. So you know that's that's going back quite a number of years. Mm. Um, and yeah, it was it was successful. Um, you know, grew and grew. Uh, they kept winning contracts from government to build roads. And uh, again, at that time, open cast coal mining was was still was still booming. So um, yeah, I, it, I I did that. Um, got myself qualified. I think that was the important thing. Uh, got myself qualified as accountant. I, you know, I worked through the business. I was a, I was a cost accountant, and then I was a senior cost accountant. Became uh, a management accountant for one of the divisions, uh, and I left that business to go and work in Nottingham, very briefly for a for a company called Lily Developments. Um, they were into property development, and uh, that all coincided with the crash in the in the early nineties. So it was uh, the early nineties recession. That business went into receivership. Uh, I was out of work and I got a job with Group 4. Uh, and I suppose I've never looked back. So I joined Group 4 in early 1993. And that coincided with government first outsourcing uh, prisoner escorting services. And Group 4 won the first ever contract with that. So this, uh, they the previous year they'd won... Uh, Wald's Prison, which was the first outsourced prison in the UK. Uh, and as I joined the business, and it was the reason I joined the business, it was the, for the first prisoner escorting contract. And that was my introduction into the justice market. Wow. So you were, you were part of the very early um, outsourced market on the justice sector. How do you think the market evolved as you evolved in your career as well, Colin? I suppose, it, it, you know, I was in right at the start. Uh, I mean, the, these things that were happening were really a product of uh, of the Thatcher government. Uh, you know, as you were aware, back in those days, uh, that government was determined to break the stranglehold, as they saw it, of the, of the public sector unions on some of these services, which were, weren't well delivered. They were expensive. Uh, and it was when they when there was a, a real drive to introduce the private sector just to drive some change in some of these things. So as we went through the early 90s, um, more and more of the escorting of prisoners was was outsourced. So uh, over the coming three years, it went from one region of the UK right through to pretty much the whole of the UK was outsourced. Uh, at that time, more prisons began to be outsourced. It, we were right in the middle of the PFI program, so prisons were being built uh, under the under the PFI program. And similarly, around things like youth justice, there were there were more and more things being outsourced. So that business at the time just grew exponentially. I think when I joined the business, it had a it had a turnover of, of five million. By the time I left. Some ten years later, uh, th that business had a turnover way over two hundred million. So it was, it was a period of, of massive growth, one way or another. Uh, and when the Blair government was elected in ninety seven, it, it really didn't change anything. You know, the drive continued to to outsource. In fact, the, the pace probably picked up. So um, it was a great sector to be in, one way or another. Lots of growth, lots of opportunity and loads and loads of innovation as well at the time. That's brilliant, Colin. And what fascinates you about criminal justice, Colin? You have been in the industry for like 25 odd years now and you have seen all these changes. What really fascinates you about the UK criminal justice, both public and private? I, you know, it's, it, it, I know everybody says it about their jobs, but there's something different every day. Mm. Uh, that, that is for sure. It, it is unique. I mean, it, it's one of those things where it, it really does change people's lives. So mm. I think when people talk about 
um, you, know, you know, certainly an environment of working at the moment where people deliver FM services, which make people's working environments better. There's no doubt about that. But I think what we do is actually touch people. We, we touch their lives. Uh, you know, there is a common theme that we are caring for vulnerable adults. And, um, yeah, it's, it's an intellectual challenge as well. You know, I think, uh, I think the thing that really fascinates me and the thing that really keeps me interested in it and always has is that I suppose I'm a bit of a political nerd underneath it all. I do like politics. I do like gathering data. I do like to understand what's happening. I, you know, I, I do enjoy public policy debates. So to actually run a business um, that is involved in all of that with the politics, but also the delivery of public services is, is for me, that's, that's the great thing. Because, you know, every, every day I'll... I still do it, you know. I, I still review things. I, I you know I read the Economist. I, I look on Twitter, all the rest of it, uh, and I think that's the real attraction for me. Is it's just that fascination with with delivering public policy. That's great, Colin. That's great. So, uh, and two thousand nine, you started Mighty, Colin. And how was the journey going so far? Uh, yeah, well, really well. Uh, I mean, I uh, you know after. Um, after I, I left uh, Group 4 or GSL, as it, as it was in those days, um, I, I joined the GEO Group and I, I, I did a startup for them. It was, it was not in the same, I, I didn't have skin in the game as I did with Mighty. You know, it was very much uh, a, a paid salaried role to, to establish a business for the GEO Group in the UK. But I think what it did for me it gave me the confidence to uh, to start up another business. So I, you know, I enjoyed that. It was it was a great experience. Did that for about three and a half, four years. Um, but I think what that did was drive me towards the point where I thought, well, I can do this, uh, and that led me to uh, to a conversation with Mighty. And certainly in those days, Mighty was still was still management incentive through investment equity. Uh, so we we did a startup, you know. We we est- we established a startup with a clear purpose to develop a business in uh, the outsourced uh, criminal justice sector, and that's what we've done. Um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't look like the original business plan, that is for sure. But uh, where we have been phenomenally <coughs> phenomenally successful is uh, is around uh, immigration in particular. Mm-hmm. So we we built some great relationships with Home Office. Uh, we are responsible for large parts of uh, immigra- immigration enforcement delivery, uh, and uh, we've also built a fairly significant uh, business with uh, quite a number of police forces across the UK as well. So, you know, if I look back, um, you know, the, the literally. Uh, you know, back in the 2009, there was uh, there was myself and Paul Ferry who established the business. Um, we were sat in a corner office in Milton Keynes. Uh, we were borrowing a bit of space from Mighty Security Business at the time, um, and we set off. You know, it was all about well, we're, we're going to compete against Circo, G4S, uh, and, and looking back on it, it looks a bit stupid, really. But um, we uh, we did it. You know, we we managed to. Uh, secure an early contract for an immigration removal centre at Campsfield House. Uh, and we've gone from there and grown a fairly substantial business. Wow, I mean, like, uh, from being part of an exec team in a, in a multinational corporation to suddenly become an entrepreneur and take that entrepreneurship all the way into another large corporate calling. That's a beautiful journey there. Well done. Colin, we talked about your career. Is there any three things, Colin, that not many people know about you? Any three things? Um, well, I, I suppose, you know, in terms of hidden passions, if that's what, you, what you're interested in, although, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, again, people that know me know uh, I've got a real passion for, for Mansfield Town Football Club, which, <laughs> which, again, is pretty bizarre. But, again, that's a reflection of where I grew up. Um, and I used to get taken along to watch uh, watch the stags uh, by my uh, by my eldest brother. Um, so and that stayed with me. Um, I've got a real passion for uh, 
for Jeff Lynn. Uh, and again, that was that goes back to my youth. Uh, I was really into the electric light orchestra. And uh, yeah, Jeff's uh, uh, a musician that I've always followed and I've followed his career. So it's, it's great over recent years that he's been He's been back on the road. So, you know, certainly passions outside work are, are like, I do like my music. I, 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 I like sport uh, and I, I, I like things like cycling as well. So, I, you know, um, outside that, it's really, it's, it's family. Uh, that's, that, those are the things that are really important to me. Yes, Colin, I think that's beautiful, beautiful passion there at the end. So, uh, Colin, you had a stronger 25-year career, passionate about UK public services, entrepreneur, you know, all these passions. If you can list out like three key achievements so far, what would you uh, say? Three key achievements. I think, um, it, 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 I suppose it's difficult to to uh because i always think well it's, it's better for other people to judge what what those achievements are but i think the things that i'm i'm most proud of is is uh, i think what we've got in the business is a great culture i think um what what we've developed in care and custody is a is a real public service ethos but it's also driven by a an, an entrepreneurial can do attitude I think that's really important. I think, um, you know, if I go back to my earlier point about uh, I've got an interest in public policy, and I think one of the things that, that tends to frustrate people is that they can, <laughs> they can see what needs to be done. Um, and, you know, we all see it every day around how public services are, are delivered. Um, but uh, you understand that moving moving the dial with the public sector to get things to change, to move is, is, is a real challenge. Uh, but we can do that. You know, we, we can come up with different delivery models. We can come up with, um, you know, unique ways of doing things. I think uh, certainly with care and custody, um, despite the largest part of our business being immigration, I think the, the, th the thing, one of the things I'm most proud of is, is the, is the forensic medical examiner aspect of our business. What, what we've done there is it was absolutely change the way that forensic medical examiner services are delivered in, uh, in uh, police forces in England and Wales. There's no doubt about that. I think when we, when we got into this sector back in 2016, it, it was doctor led, you know, almost everywhere. Um, doctors were delivering or deciding how services would be delivered to an individual that came into police detention. Um, so the police were very much reliant on the way that doctors behaved, whether they would turn up, all the rest of it. Uh, what we've established is a proper embedded model where nurses deliver that service and they deliver it so much better. Uh, it's, it's more effective, it's more efficient. Um, and I think, you know, when we look back on things like that, we, I, I think that's a, probably a common theme in terms of what do I look back on as achievements and with pride, it, it is things like that. And certainly the way that we deliver the, uh, the escorting services contract for home office, again, what we've established over the past two years is an entirely different model of delivering that service. I mean, that, that contract had a long, long history of failure both financially for the contractor, but also from a delivery perspective. And, you know, we, we've been consistently delivering that contract above 99% uh, delivery. And I think that, that, you know, that those sort of things, that, yeah, I do look back and think, well, yeah, we've, we've changed things. You know, there's, there's a degree of pride with things like that. It's quite interesting because you have a numbers background being an accountant, but you have such a people element behind you. How do you balance those, Colin? <laughs> I, I go back to what I was saying earlier. I mean, I hated my first job <laughs> and that was a numbers job. It was just a very, very dry sitting in an office looking at spreadsheets. Well, it wasn't even spreadsheets in those days. It was ledgers. It, so it was, it was looking at... Uh, ledgers and various things like that and uh, I mean that's it, it has it has its place but I think what it gave me was a great discipline in the end I think my accountancy background has given me a, a good discipline 
uh, a real deep understanding of the commercial aspects of running a business. But in the end, I think what, what has always mattered to me is the people I work with and the team. Um, and that, cause that's really what I get the enjoyment out of. And I think if we, if we get the team right, uh, and we're all broadly pulling in the same direction, then everything else follows. Um, and I think that's where we come from that, you know, it's, it is about the team. It is about people pulling together and it is about running a sustainable business. And I think that's where the numbers aspect come into it is that we are very clear that what we do has to be sustainable, but in the end, it's always driven by service first. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's just given me a good balance one way or another, uh, cause generally, yeah, I, I, I do like people on the whole. So, and I think, you know, that's, the, that's when you get the best part out of people is, uh, you know, as, when we all get on together as a team, as opposed to, uh, you know, not necessarily pulling together as a team and just having a real focus on numbers. I think as a team, we have a real focus on service as opposed to numbers. That's brilliant, Colin. So now going back to where we are, Colin, you know, we are in this testing times, we are in lockdown, there is some level of, uh, you know, face to release as we are going through. But when this lockdown was in place, I mean, like maybe late March or something, when the news hit you, uh, you know, as a lead, how did you react to it immediately? And you know, how did you set the procedures to ensure that things are um, kind of can be managed quickly? Uh, yeah, I, I think like everybody else, when, <laughs> when it all first happened, um, and I, I can't believe there's anybody thought, yeah, I know what I'm going to do here, um, because I don't think anybody did. And I think that runs right through the country that, it, this this was, and everybody's used the word endlessly since, but it was all a bit unprecedented. Mm-hmm. So I, I think from, from my perspective, number one was just ensuring that everybody was safe. And again, I know that sounds a little bit trite, but it was just understanding uh, where our people were, uh, what they were doing. And I think we were very clear from day one that we would follow government advice very closely, um, certainly around... Um, people self-isolating and shielding and we would do everything that we could to ensure that people felt safe so uh, certainly that's been the policy all the way through was to make sure that if people needed to self-isolate they needed to shield they needed to care for elderly relatives uh, child care whatever it happened to be then that came first so we we made provision for that and we we reconfigured the business to make sure that all that could happen uh, so where we had excess resource, where demand dropped away, we tried to shift that resource to support where we were still uh, experiencing demand. So that that was that was a big part of it. I think like everybody else, the, the whole PPE thing was always a bit of a challenge. Um, happily, it wasn't a significant challenge, certainly on the immigration side of the business. More of a challenge with our... Uh, medical examiners, so our healthcare professionals. Uh, we did have some challenges around that, but again, you know, working through all that. So um, uh, the, the other side was then really with the client. Um, and again, what we've experienced with, with all our clients, almost without exception, is that they've been massively supportive. Mm. So everybody understands that, you know, uh, what we need to do is, is to keep the service going, first and foremost. So what we've been able to do is to keep everybody employed, and, that, and that's great. Uh, and just work through with our clients to make sure that um, we have sufficient people to deliver the service. And if, if, uh, if there are issues around having insufficient resource, that we work together to make sure that we, that we manage that safely. So it, I think it's it's been an evolving thing. Um, so it's, it started with the people, understanding what we needed to do with our people, and then it's really just been working through to make sure people are safe, but also working with the client to ensure that we we have continuity of service, and and that's worked pretty well all the way through. That's great, Colin. And uh, some of the facilities, as you mentioned, Colin, are like uh, you know you can move them into virtual space, people work from home safely. But uh, but while the lockdown happened, our immigration facilities were still open and staff were, uh, staff were also there at some point. How did you balance 
the expectations there, Colin, and what sort of safeguarding procedures and stuff that was went very quickly on them? Um, yeah, I, as I say, I think it was just making sure, I suppose, the, the, the ultimate thing was making sure that we had, um, we had safe systems of work for everybody. So, because in the end, I think a lot of this is a, is a confidence thing to some extent. So, um, we had to make sure that people felt comfortable to work in the environments we're asking them to work in. So, uh, we, we worked, again, you know, there's plenty of guidance out there from government, from Public Health England, working within that guidance, but also uh, developing our own safe systems of work where, so everybody is clear you know, how, how things will operate. I mean, a good, a good example has been just operating the immigration removal centre effectively what's, what's happened over the period is that uh, the immigration removal centre has almost become a series of households. So individuals now operate within sort of an extended household uh, and those households don't interact with other households within the centre. Everybody has access to the activities they need and all the welfare that they need, but they're doing it within a household. And, it, and it's the same for our staff, that they are, they are operating within that sort of environment and they understand that, you know, everybody is, is, is being kept safe as far as they possibly can be within, that, within those sort of environments. I suppose, you know, one of, one of the high profile examples with us at the moment would be the number of uh, small boat cases that are coming across the, the channel at the moment. Um, again, it's high profile. It's one of those things that's in the news. But, you know, we work, we work very closely with Home Office to ensure that those individuals are, are dealt with um, humanely, carefully and safely. Um, because uh, again, you know, there is there's always that concern that p people may be symptomatic and all the rest of it. So uh, I think what we've established with Home Office over the past uh, couple of months is a is a is a good system of working to ensure that you know first and foremost the detainees are are safe, but uh, almost equally, or, well, definitely equally as importantly, um, you know, our, our colleagues are safe as well. So. It, it's just having that that holistic approach with home office that you know there are the priorities have changed and no doubt um, so you know so what are those priorities and how do we deliver that that safely for everybody um, and I think say so it, it really goes back to partnership partnerships good um, we work closely with them um, and they uh, and they listen you know to to our advice so. Uh, I think again, it, on the whole, it's been pretty successful. Wow! So, uh, how is Mighty now gearing up for the return to work? The Karen custody arm. Um, I think, from our perspective, we're we're, <laughs> we're not. <laughs> you know, everybody's been at work. Um, the, the challenge, I think, the challenge for us um, has been through this period because of what we do. Um, uh, a lot of our training and certainly recruitment uh, and initial training relies on uh, intimate contact one way or another mm -hmm. and when I say intimate contact so if you if you take a custody officer part of their training is is first aid uh, but it's also things like control and restraint training and all of those things rely on intimate contact one way or another so that there is there are some challenges around that how we deliver it in the future uh, how we refresh people with their training. And certainly when we're bringing on board new colleagues uh, through recruitment, how, how we, uh, again, how, we, how do we deliver that training to get people properly accredited? So I think those, those are the, the big challenges for us at the moment. Uh, it's similar on the, on the medical side of the business where people need refresher training. So, those, those are the big challenges. I mean, in terms of return to work, um, we are at work and, you know, that hasn't gone away. We've continued to work all the way through this. So uh, we're, not, we're not looking for large numbers of colleagues to come back to work or to go into new environments or, or different environments. Um, I think our challenge will be to, uh, to make sure that people are properly equipped to do their job as we go forward. 
good luck with that, Colin. Good luck. So, hundred percent, as you mentioned, Colin, there is a, it's a team effort, and everybody stepped up, including you, your senior management, and uh, you know your partners in home office and others. Can you do you have any kind of inspiring stories or any shout outs that you want to give within your team or the wider team? I, you know, it's endless. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 it's, again, I think it, from my perspective, it's the most humbling aspect of, of what we do. Um, you know, it's easy for me. I, I've really not left home for two months. Uh, I, you know, I, I've gone no further than the local shop. Mm. Um, yes, I've been busy at my desk every day, but, you know, there are thousands of our colleagues that are out there every day and uh you know the, the examples of what people have done are just uh well they're incredible you know I, if we take some of our medics um <clears throat> you know they're doing their day job so they're working for us during the day in uh, in police custody suites which is demanding enough and certainly with CV19, it's, in, it's increased those demands just in terms of the way that personal interactions work, uh, you know, the PPE that they're now required to, to wear and, and, you know, just everything that hangs around working in that sort of environment during the period we're going through. And, I mean, not only do they do that, but when they've done that, a number of them are then going on, on rest days and whatever else to complete shifts for their local NHS trust uh, often in intensive care uh, units, and it's just incredible. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible that they they choose to do that. Uh, you know, so I think it's it, a lot of it's just humbling, really, in terms of the the lengths that people are prepared to go to to make sure that their fellow human beings are cared for. Um, it's um, yeah, it's it's a real eye opener, and I suppose like everybody else. Uh, that there is some hope that once all this is over, that some of that spirit continues. And how did you adapt to new normal? I suppose, uh, you know, it's in some ways I'm fortunate in the, I, I don't, like a lot of senior roles, I don't really have a, have a structured day. Mm. So, um, in, in, in normal course of events, things tend to be very much almost demand driven, you know, as, as things happen in the business, then uh, I react. Clearly, there's a, there's a degree of strategy around what we do and how we do it. But uh, on a day to day basis, um, it, it would always be driven by, you know, priorities as they occur within any, within any given day and week. Uh, and that's not changed, really. Um, I think what uh, I'm still, that, that's not changed. The business, as, as I described earlier, is still carrying on. Uh, we've been phenomenally lucky, I believe, in that certainly through this period, um, we've won quite quite uh, significant amounts of business. So we are, we are continuing to, you know, grow. We are continuing to expand what we do. So... Uh, from that perspective, not a lot's changed. You know, it's, it's busy, there's plenty going on, there's people I need to talk to. I think uh, it, it's just getting used to doing it all from a, a desk. And it's a bit like this, if I'm honest, Beth. Um, mm. uh, you know, normally I'd, I'd come and see you and I'd, I'd probably come and see you in Croydon. I'd sit across the desk from you and we'd talk. Mm. Uh, and, and I think that's been the biggest change for me is is actually not been able to meet people and and talk and and whilst things like Teams and Zoom are good and they they help with that team dynamic to some extent, I think that the biggest challenge I'm I'm facing is is how do we maintain that team dynamic? I, I think as I said earlier, you know, I think part of the successes of the business or a big part of the success of the business has been has been the team. There's been people getting on and having a common purpose. And, it, and it's just holding some of those threads together. Uh, I think that's that's the challenge of, of doing everything remotely when people don't get together anymore. Because yes. it's, those, it's those social bonds that really do help. You know, again, in the normal course of events, what would we do? You know, well, we might we might go out for a coffee or, you know, in the evening we go out for a, for a meal or, or a beer or whatever it happens to be. And all that's missing at the moment. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I think some of those things do do hold teams together. So I think that's that, that's the biggest challenge, I think. Wow. Yes, I can imagine. So I know, you know, we, we talk about people, we talk about business, but, you know, at, as 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 a leader of a business you take a lot to yourself as well and you need to some way or the other you know not just keep yourself inspired but also keep yourself sane because so many things are happening around you how is life at the top of the corporate ladder and how do you keep yourself you know sane Colin? you know i've uh, I, i'm i've always been pretty good uh, in some ways divorcing work from from private life i think the, the challenge with CV19 is that, like a, like a lot of people, I'm sort of living above the shop. I, I never leave it. Mm. So my office, my office is at home. I'm at home, and I'm at home the whole time. And I think there is there are there are some challenges around just closing everything down and putting it in a corner, so you're not you're not dealing with with things the whole time. But I, I think the way certainly for me, the way I cope is is other stuff. You know, it's my it's my it's my other interests. It's my other passions in life, and. Uh, I mean, what what this has enabled me to do is is to get out and cycle more, if, if mm. nothing else. You know, I'm, uh, it's those sort of things just to get outside and uh, cycle, do some mountain biking, all those sort of things. Um, it's it's just it's just finding something that provides a bit of separation from from work on a on a day to day basis uh, to uh, I suppose to real life. So. Um, yeah, it's, it is a challenge. So it's uh, like you, you know, living above the shop, you never get away from it. Uh, I think it's just it's just finding those other other interests and passions. And, you know, and, and I'm fortunate at the moment in that, you know, one of my uh, one of my daughters has come home for the period of this as well. So it's uh, it, again, that's a bit of normality. Oh, yes, that's beautiful. So I know, you know, people inspires you at work but if you if you want to give an advice to someone who's wanting to pursue a similar career like yourself what advice would you give them um i've I've always been a great believer in have a direction of travel so you know uh, people describe it in different ways you know have a north star whatever it is but i think you always have a have a goal in mind um say well that's really where i want to get to uh, and um, and be determined and be resilient. I think for me, um, you know, I I don't consider myself any sort of uh, business genius or anything like that. But I always had a rough idea of where I wanted to go. Mm. Uh, and if if there's one thing I am, I am determined and I am quite resilient. And I think it's it's those sort of things that that will take you to where you want to be in the end. I mean, certainly with care and custody, you know, we've. Uh, <laughs> We've we've had some ups and downs over the years, and uh, you know, in the business we've got we've got uh, we've got an analogy we always draw. And I think if you watch The Apprentice, it's one of those things. So you know, on any given week, the losing team will always go down the losers' cafe, uh, and we relate to that as a team. That you know, there's been occasions where, certainly in the early days of the business, where we were going after big contracts and we didn't win them. Uh, and it's a bit grim, you know. So we would all go down somewhere, have a coffee, have a sandwich, and we'd all, you know, we'd all debate where we were at. Um, but again, it's a bit like The Apprentice, you know. It's like, well, well we dust ourselves down and we go again. And I think it's, uh, you know, that's the thing for me. It, it is about having ha- having an idea of where you want to get to. Um, and certainly the shape of this business doesn't look like I thought it would 10 years ago, that is for sure. But it, it, we, we had a good idea of where we wanted to get to. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just having, it's being resilient yourself. I think that's really important. I think what, what I bring to our team is, is that degree of resilience. And uh, I think by nature, I'm quite a calm individual. And I think that helps. Uh, but I think it's, it, it's important you surround yourself with people that are also resilient. If, if you look, Colin, not everybody becomes a CEO. So what propels some people to the rank of CEO and not others? Uh, you know, that's a combination of things. I mean, I think some people are are just massively massively driven aren't they and uh, they you know it, it 
uh, being the leader and the CEO absolutely dominates who they are and it dominates their being. Mm. I, I, I don't think I fall into that category. I think what I what I fall into is is much more of uh, a, a, a desire to you know it's it's almost a you want to change things. Um, it gets back to the purpose of of the business that we were sort of talking about earlier that. Um, I just felt that there was always, and there is, an ongoing opportunity just to do things differently and do them better. Uh, and I suppose you can always hang about and wait for somebody else to come along and do that and go and work for them. Or you can do it yourself. And I think I think I, I, I was very much, well, I, I, I'm, I, I can do this, we can do this. Um, so that's, I think that's the drive for me is, is, is that desire to, to have a business with a real purpose to do something, to change things. And, uh, and, and that drives what, what I do. And I think what we do. Wow. What's one thing you wish you had known when you began your career? <laughs> uh, it, uh, I think, uh, you know, I've, um, my my wife would say, you know, I, I haven't got a chip on my shoulder. I've got to. Um, I I you know I grew up in a so I grew up in really what was sort of a, a mining community, and there wasn't uh, an, an enormous amount of ambition where I you know in the part of the world I grew up. You know, I, I know you can't you can't always generalise like that, but the, I think that was true to a to a degree. And there was uh, there were, there was always a notion of settling for second best, and you know that's not for us. Mm. Uh, I, I must I must admit I I was probably I was probably in my early thirties before I realised that actually I could do stuff like this. Um, because prior to that, it was always for somebody else. You know, uh, you know why 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 would I be able to compete with? Somebody? you've got an Oxbridge education for example mm. I, I didn't think I could uh, so what what would I say I would I, it's confidence I think as much as anything else it, it's confidence it's belief and uh, then it gets back to determination and resilience so I think it, what would I have liked to have known I think in you know in my in my early days in my early 20s I, I I wish I'd had the confidence that I have now. I suppose a lot of people would say that, but, uh, you know, certainly just have the confidence to go and do things. As a child, what did you wish to become when you grew up? I, I wanted to be an airline pilot. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, ask me why. I, can't, I can distinctly remember sitting in, uh, you know, in the, in the classroom when I was a kid saying, yeah, I want to be an airline pilot. I've, I've no idea why I did, but I did. But um, I, clearly that never happened. <laughs> not yet. Let's say not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so what trait do you, do you like the most about yourself? Um, what trait do I like the most? Uh, yes, it's a good one. I... Um, yeah, I, I think my probably my calmness under pressure. I think uh, mm. I, I think it, it works for me. I, I don't tend to get uh, emotional or or phased by things, and uh, hopefully that translates to the team as well. Oh, brilliant! So, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Um, you know, I've, I I love um, I love making things and uh, doing things with that with my hands. You know, I, I, I suppose I grew up in a in a practical family. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to be a painter and decorator because I know that's really hard work. But I, um, you know, I, I'd like to be a potter or something like that. Uh, oh. I've got a real fascination with with making things, so uh, I think that that would work for me. Oh, that's amazing. You imagine Colin the Potter. <laughs> <laughs> I'll order it straight away, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could go to the past or future, where would you stay and why? I'm not particularly fond of looking back, but I, th I think if, if, it was the, uh, if it was the past, I think... Uh, the thing I miss most is, is is the girls growing up, is my girls growing up. So, you know, I would go back to 
when they were, you know, three, four, and five, that that sort of age. I think, you know, that that's just magical. And I think when you look back, uh, you, you do miss things like that. There's there's no doubt about that. In terms of future, um, future for me is is uh, I suppose from a business point of view is is the continued success of what we do. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the, the belief that we can we can continue to grow the business uh, and turn it into something even more substantial um, I think that's that's certainly where I'd like to be over the next five years perfect yeah but uh, given the choice that you prefer to be on the past to be with family but if you want to go with the future it will be with the business let's take that way yeah nice. yeah yeah I, I'd say uh, other things in the future I, I, I don't know I mean um yeah, life happens, doesn't it? What was the best year of your life and why? <laughs> oh, man, that is so difficult. Uh, I, I, that, I don't know whether there is a particular... I'd say, go back to, um, you know... Uh, mid mid 90s when when the girls came along i think all of that is, is a real change of life and uh, uh really life affirming so i, I suppose of, of all things that that would be that would probably be it for me i would go back to sort of uh you know mid late 90s if uh, if if, uh, if i could oh, perfect. yeah What's the scariest thing you have ever done? <laughs> yeah, this is something I volunteered for, isn't it? Uh, I, it I, so a few years ago, it, it was my 50th birthday. Uh, and what I decided to do was uh, a group of us went on an adventure weekend to Slovenia. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, I'd been skiing there the year before and it, I, I just thought this is a fabulous place and I got talking to a few people and they said I'll come back in the summer and you know you, you'll love it so we we went on an adventure weekend and we did whitewater rafting and uh, we did some mountain biking and uh, you know we did some walking and uh, Oh, there was all sorts of things but uh, what in the on one afternoon we did canyoning now, if you've never done that, uh, I'm not sure I'd recommend it. But what it what it means you do is you abseil down into a canyon, and then you follow the river out of the canyon. So you have to uh, go wherever the river goes, and that includes uh, some more abseiling, some climbing, uh, and the most frightening part was jumping off a ledge. Uh, sort of halfway down a waterfall into into the river at the bottom, mm. and they were very clear that unless you actually jumped out, you may hit a load of rocks at the bottom. So actually forcing myself, <laughs> because I'm not good with heights, to to jump. Uh, I think it was something like uh, 12 meters uh, off a ledge into a river below, avoiding some rocks. Um, yeah, that stays with me. I was, I was, uh, yeah, I think that will stay with me to the day I die one way or another. So, yeah, that, and I volunteered for that, bizarrely. Yes, that's it. That's it. I think that sounds amazing. I, for the 50th birthday, Colin, I think that's the best thing you could do, isn't it? Do something that, that you remember and looks like you have a very memorable moment there. That's oh, moment. yeah, yeah. I think we all enjoyed it. You know, it was a really memorable weekend. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, I certainly look back on that. And it's, uh, yeah, one of the best things I've ever done. Yes, 100%. So, um, looking back on your successful career, beautiful family and, uh, you know, amazing team. So who are the people who have been the most influential in your life and career? Um, you know, I've got a... a um, my mum's an inspiration to us all. I think uh, she, I mean, she's still about, she's, uh, she's 93 and she's still a real matriarch of, of, of our family. So I think, uh, I think we all look up to what my mum and dad achieved because they, uh, they married uh, just after the day and, uh, they, my, my dad was actually steaming back to uh, Japan because he was in the he was in the Royal Navy during the war, and he was he was going back to Japan when the Americans uh, dropped 
the Avon. So that they built a family from literally nothing, I suppose, from the ashes of uh, from the Second World War. So I think uh, you know that that is that is inspirational. I think that sort of runs through the family uh, one way or another. Uh, and certainly, you know, say the influence of family, and and certainly my I've got to say my sister. <laughs> at a relatively early age because the, the, the was, there was some danger I'd end up being, being a painter and decorator said you need to get out you need to go and do other things and uh, she encouraged me to uh, you know to forge a career elsewhere so I think from that perspective I'd probably you know point at family more than anything Wow I think yeah 100% Colin the inspiration comes from within and it's beautiful so uh Who's the kindest person you know? It's uh, a, a guy called Mike Collins, who I, I've known Mike for I don't know twenty odd years now. But actually, as a as an individual and as a as an inspiration, he's he's the kindest guy you could meet. He is, uh, you know, he's he's uh, he's a mentor. Uh, he provides, you know, he provides me with with almost inspiration every time I speak to him because he's just that sort of individual. So mm-hmm. I think I think it's finding people like that in your life that actually give you a, a little bit of inspiration and uh, and 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 mentorship. And I think you know those sort of things are really important to me. Wow, that's great. So, uh, what's one kind or thoughtful thing someone did to you recently? <laughs> yeah, I got an email a couple of weeks ago. So we, I, we we've got uh, an individual in the business. She joined us just over a year ago, and uh, out of the blue, you know, uh, like a lot of us, she's working from home at the moment. She sent me an email saying, "I'm sat at home thinking I've been with the business for a year. I'm really grateful. You know, it, it's great to be part of the team. I really enjoy working with you guys." it was lovely because uh, you don't really you don't get things like that too often and i think that the fact that somebody had had taken the time out to think about it uh write it send an email um great and i think you know those i think those sort of actions are, are life affirming as much as anything else so I, I, i'd probably point to that yes that's great so uh What's the biggest lesson life has taught you so far? If you're resilient and determined enough, then within a reason, you you, you know you can you can a- achieve things. I think that's 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 a big important message that uh, have confidence and uh, and be determined in what you want to do and where you want to get to. I think those are the important things. And uh, beyond that. Um, on the whole most people are great <laughs> you know i I, th- i think i've that that's what i've learned i think you know there's a lot of cynicism mm. around who people are and the way that they behave but i think what what i find on the day almost on a daily basis is that most people are decent kind human beings and uh, I, i think it's i think life has taught me that that on on the whole people are, are are decent and they will do the right thing and uh you know we 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 can all build better things as a consequence of that yes that's great so uh last one before we go for the final question so what's the best piece of advice you have received and from whom um Yeah, I, I, I suppose I'll, I'll go back to um, what I was saying earlier uh, about family, uh, and certainly my my sister, because I think it was it was probably that was a real turning point for me. Um, she, you know, she was the one that sat me down and said, "Look, you, you don't need you don't need to stay at home. You don't need to uh, um, be a painter and decorator." you can actually go and do other things because there's a big world out there and you should go and go and find out what you can do and and get away and do things uh and i think uh, in terms of the influence that's had on my life and uh and the way things have turned out that that was probably the you know the biggest piece of advice i had 
Wow, that's very profound advice. Very simple, but to, but look at the direction that you have taken, uh, Colin. So give my regards to your sister. Amazing. <laughs> So what's something that you're looking forward to in the future? I think, as like everybody else at the moment, um, a bit of normality as much as anything. I think uh, uh, it's, it, 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 uh, as we were discussing earlier, really, really missing uh, the sort of social interaction stuff uh, with, with people. And I think that that'll be great. Um, really missing really missing my football uh you know those, those sort of sporting things are massively important in my life so i think uh, what that's that's what as i sit here today those are the things i'm looking forward to the most is is getting back to to some degree of uh, of normality so we we can all enjoy life a little more than we are at the moment What have you observed lately that reminded you that people are kind? Yeah, I, I think we discussed this a bit earlier, really, Baz. I think it, you, you, uh, you just look at uh, the way that uh, people have reacted to, to this whole crisis. Um, and certainly within our business, the, the way that uh, some people have acted to help others um, you know, we, I think we talked about some of the things that the medics are doing, but uh, guys on the immigration side, some great examples there where uh, clearly, you know, we're quieter on that side of the business quite simply because, you know, our, our borders at the moment are to all intents and purposes closed. So, there are, you know, as you would expect, there are fewer people uh, coming through the system at the moment, but I suppose that could be an opportunity for people to do not a lot, but what we've, what we found is that you know large numbers of our uh, officers are just volunteering with uh, with local food banks. Uh, they're volunteering to help with local care homes. You know, delivering food, uh, helping deliver PPE equipment and things like that. And uh, again, yeah, I suppose it just takes you back to the to the point that fundamentally most people are are decent and kind. Wow, that's, that's very, very powerful, Colin. And uh, thank you so much, Colin, for your time. I mean, like, it's, it's been a real, real privilege to have you as our very first guest for Bachi Talk. And it's taken me a while to make this happen. But here we are, privileged to have you as my first guest. Wish you all the good health and happiness. Please continue to inspire not just the justice industry and your colleagues in Mighty, but everybody around you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and look after yourself, Colin. Thank you, Baz. And can I uh, can I just say the same to you? Um, you know, keep keep yourself safe, keep your family safe, and uh, hopefully, it won't be too long before we can meet up in Croydon again and um, and have a coffee. I look forward. <laughs> and the present, Colin, definitely. Thank you, Colin. To our listeners, thank you for tuning in. Please do visit bachi.com forward slash bachi talk podcast to this specific episode link to everything that was mentioned in this episode. Don't forget to subscribe, review, and share Bachi Talk podcast with your loved ones. We will see you at the next episode with another special guest. Until then, it's Bhaskar Sundram from Bachi signing off.